Hi guys, Pastor James here, just picking up where we left off last week here at Faith Fellowship Church. I don't know if you were here in person last week. If you weren't, you actually missed that week's message. And we started in and uh, we got into this whole fellowship idea. Uh, what is it really? What does it amount to? What does it do? Why does it, why does it matter? And, and so I'm just picking up where we left off last week. This week, I just want to tell you a little backstory about myself. Uh, quite a long time ago, I was part of a different church somewhere else, and I got to the point where uh, I felt like I was kind of starting to gel with some people, and we had gotten to know each other pretty well-ish, kind of, and uh, something happened where uh, this group that I was a part of actually started to disagree about a lot of things with the pastor, and the pastor wasn't budging, and they wanted to do more of what they wanted to do, and he just wasn't allowing them to have as much freedom as they wanted to do those things. And so um, after a while, I started showing up to our little gatherings that we had, and, and it was just very apparent to me that, that this was a bad situation because it turned into uh, them mostly kind of bad-mouthing the leader of the organization, and um, it was just kind of this poisonous, weird, hostile kind of environment. And, of course, I didn't have anything against the pastor. I liked the pastor. And, and so I was between a rock and a hard place. And uh, pretty soon I just had, to, oh, I got to get out of here, you know. And, uh, you know, you can imagine how it went, you know, after a while the pastor left and then after a while they left. And it was just, it was just kind of a bungle. Um, and, and when I kind of came out of that and, uh, you know, I became part of the church that I'm a part of right now, uh, I first came to my pastor at the time and I said hey you know I'm, I'm ready to ready to go further I've kind of been out of it for a while but I know I need to you know get my nose back into the grindstone and, and start growing again and start learning and start you know being challenged and, and he said great okay first thing we got to do we got to get you into some fellowship some real fellowship we got to get you in as much fellowship as we possibly can and I'm thinking do you think we could start somewhere else because I don't know that I'm really ready for that. Now, I didn't say that out loud. I was just thinking, you know, out of my mouth came, oh, okay, all right, you know, uh, <laughs> inside I'm going, uh. but the fact of the matter is, if you've been through any kind of a drama, you know, some kind of a bad situation in a church where you got burned somehow, or, or you know, maybe you were on a team and the team evaporated because they couldn't get along, you know, maybe there was some sort of scandal or something like that, you know, and, and things just kind of became a hot mess. You know, it's kind of hard to want to get back into being close with people in the church again. I've seen it over and over and over and over again. People who have been burned in some way by a past church often struggle with the idea of getting close to anybody again. And, and that's not just a church thing. I mean, that's just a human thing. Once bitten, twice shy, right? And, and you know, you get in that mode, and after a while, you know, you, you're okay with being around people again. You know, you work your way up to that. Uh, and you don't mind going places, you know, maybe serving on some events with people. But if it comes to being too close, eh, you start to get uneasy and and you do this kind of a heisman thing i call it you know where you just hey uh you can be here but not not over here okay we can be next to each other but i don't want you getting too close i don't really want you to know anything about me personally personally uh i don't want you to see me beyond what you see on facebook you know i i just i'm not comfortable getting in that close because i don't want to take the risk and and that's really not weird. That happens all the time. And, you know, the question is, for somebody who's new to church or somebody who's been part of a church a long time but has a, has a bad past experience, the question is, okay, so is there any way that the fellowship thing could just not be really that important? I mean, could that be an exception maybe for me? Because I've been, you know, I've been through some stuff. I don't, I just, no, I don't I want to do that. Could I just kind of go on this path? By myself, uh, you know, me and God, and maybe some leadership uh, influence uh, from from a little bit afar, and I will just kind of grow that way. And as much as I can see, the answer, unfortunately, unfortunately, is no. <laughs> no, you cannot. <laughs> actually, actually, the 
the call of your life, as it turns out, the, the purpose that we're all searching for, uh, the unique mission that God has created for us as believers, if you are a believer out there, is, is actually not possible to fulfill it outside of close relationships with other believers. Not possible. Um, let, me, let me show you what I'm talking about. So if you're a church person, you, you're familiar with this, this uh, passage that, that Paul wrote in the letter to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians. He writes about the uh, church as a body, and he draws this really cool metaphorical picture of a body with a head, you know, neck, arms, and all that good stuff. And as he's walking through it, he basically says, hey, you know, it's just, it's just not possible that a body can exist without a head, and it's just not, just not possible, or it's just not good, you know, if, a, if one of your body parts, like your hand frame, for instance, separates and says, I don't, I don't need that body anymore, um, neither, neither the member or the body is ever going to fulfill the potential that it had to be, everything was going to be. You know, if the hand separates itself from the body, the hand is just, you know, it's a hand on the pavement. It's not going to, not going to do anything. It can, it can, you know, do a little of this for a little while, but it's never going to fulfill its full potential as a hand, as part of a body outside of the body. It just, it's just going to be, you know, it's going to be uh, the, the hand, you know, from like the Adams family. So it can be crawling around and, and doing stuff. It would be so much better if it was connected to the body. And of course the body is going to be short that hand and it, and yeah, it's going to adapt. It's going to get by, it's going to learn, but, but it's always going to be a little short of what it could have been if it had had that member reattached. And, and Paul goes on and he, and he sums this whole thing up. He says this in first Corinthians 12, 24, he says, God has designed the body and has greater gives greater honor to the parts that lack it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its members should have mutual concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And what that's all to say is, God actually made the church in a way, on purpose. He made it such that the gifts and the, and the things that are needed for the church's mission to go forward will not go forward, can't go forward, unless you guys realize how important you all are and figure out how to learn to work closely with each other in, in relationship. To work closely, to be close, to be transparent, to be forgiving, you know, all those things. To really learn to live thoroughly bonded with one another. He said, God did this on purpose so that no one would be undervalued. In fact, this system makes you value everybody because everybody has a contribution that's necessary this way, right? So here's saying, I did this. God did this so that there wouldn't be any division in the body. Well, who cares? <laughs> why, why is that such a big deal? Why is that such a big deal? Why can't there be a little division within the body? I mean, what, what's the big deal? And what I want to point out to you is the why. Why is it so important? And the why is actually locked up inside this, this prayer that Jesus prays as he's about to be crucified. He's about to be rested and then crucified. And he's, he's with his disciples for the last time before his arrest. And he's, he's been giving this long spiel about preparing them for what's to come and how they should think and uh, taking care of each other. And he gets to the last bit of his prayer. So this is his, I'm about to go die prayer. This is the most important thing that he just, he has to hit. And this is his prayer. He says from John 17, 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Why? Okay, why? That the world may believe that you sent me. So he's saying, look, all these, 
all these disciples and all these people that are going to become believers after. This is my prayer for them. This is this is super, super, super important. Here, here it is. They all have to be one. They have to be one. They have to be so closely bonded, just like just like Father, I am so closely, intricately bonded with you, and you are so intricately bonded with me. I'm praying that they would all be intricately bonded with each other at that level of, of intensity. They've got to be that level of bonded together. Why? So that the world may believe that it was you that sent me. So if you give Jesus credit, credibility, you have to see Jesus thought it was absolutely necessary for people out there in the world to see how closely bonded that the Christians are in order to believe. There's something about that. There's some sort of a miracle about that of the people that actually believe being closely bonded in love, being super, super connected, working with each other, adapting to each other, you know, doing all of the things that love entails, you know, confronting each other, um, asking for forgiveness, showing mercy, being generous, you know, looking out for each other's needs, you know, being so committed to prayer for each other and helping each other understand. And, you know, that whole idea that, uh, you know, I need to learn to wash my brother's feet, you know, if you've read uh, through the end of the Gospel of John, there's a, there's a foot washing in there. Uh, there's an incredible little thing that's become a ceremony for many churches. And, and he's saying, look, you have got to be intricately bonded with the other believers in order to fulfill your God-given purpose. You can't do it without it. You have to do this. Because it's a miracle that people need to see. Yeah, sure, uh, you can see... Uh, the signs and the wonders, you know, you could see somebody get a healing, you could see somebody uh, get, I guess, struck by lightning. I mean, you could see all kinds of things happen that are otherwise impossible. But Jesus says, this is the miracle. This is the one that the world needs to see so that they can believe that it was really God that sent me and started this, started this movement, started this gospel thing. Okay. And, and I don't know about you or uh, I know about me though. And, and, I get tricked into thinking that Jesus prayed something more like this. And just listen to this one, okay? Father, I pray for those who will believe in me through their word that they would really get their ducks in a row, just like I have my ducks in a row, that their ducks would be as our ducks are, Father. As my ducks are your ducks and your ducks are my ducks, that the world will look upon their ducks and wish they had ducks just like those. You know, sometimes I get tricked into thinking that the key to making any kind of impact or influence in this world is by finally somehow attaining a level of success in the various aspects of my life such that people are impressed and they can give me some credibility and listen to what I have to say. Now, I'm not saying that, that sometimes having a mess in your life isn't a distraction because it sure can be a distraction. But the point, the point is not that we need to get to a place where our lives are perfectly in order and we have lives that people would just, you know, love to have. Um, you know, sometimes that happens, but, but honestly, that's not the point. Jesus said the real convincing happens when you see imperfect and weak people, flawed people on a journey to grow together and they are bonded closely in that journey, working together very closely for the same mission to fulfill their God-given cause to bring the truth to light in the world and bring good news and bring honest love that represents the Father that actually loves us all. That's the thing. That's the thing. I thought at times that, you know, the more perfecter my life got, the more successful I was, that'd be the thing that helps people see how much God loves them. And honestly, that's stupid. That doesn't make any sense. What what does that mean? All that all that does is it makes me makes me look like some kind of a a guy whose life is perfect and and makes everybody think that, you know, maybe my life was just always perfect and that's good for me, but that doesn't help them understand how God loves them. It absolutely doesn't. You know, the good news is that the pressure is off. <laughs> you don't have to live a perfect life. You don't have to come up to a, a certain level of, of financial amazingness. You know, you don't have to have an amazing house. You don't have to have 
you don't have to have perfect children. You don't have to have perfect anything, really, and you never will. But the the best thing that you could do is to be on a path where you're closely bonded with other believers in a, in a journey together, accomplishing the same overall mission together to bring the truth to light in the world, to love people, and to to forgive and to offer forgiveness. I mean, that is that is the mission of the church, to bring the gospel to light and bring Jesus to the center of focus. And and for those of you out there who've been thinking that, man, I'll just never, I'll never become anybody that has any influence. The pressure is off to have the perfect life here, okay? That's not what Jesus wants. Jesus wants you to have a bonded life with believers at a level that is that is persuasive to others. That in fact, the love that that we're talking about with this Jesus and the Father that sent him, and apparently he's he's actually God in the flesh. Like how how is that? How is that possible? They say he, God loves us all, but then I see all these things. The credibility comes when people see how impacting that is when it actually becomes real in people's lives and they begin to live as Jesus says that they should live together. Okay? Now, I don't know, maybe I've not persuaded you. Maybe the words of Jesus and the words of Paul don't don't mean a lot to you. But back up for a second, you know, and think about think about who in your past has really, really influenced you. You know, really made a difference in a positive way. Think about somebody who's really managed to persuade you to take a left when you were headed right. Think about somebody who was uh, trying to do the right thing and, and just wanted to be genuinely good to you. Uh, you know, think about the impact that those kinds of people have had. Think about the kinds of impact that you could have if you were part of a community that was closely bonded, like Jesus is hoping these believers will become closely bonded. Chances are, if you are a believer, you can trace it back to a point where, where you were exposed to a group of people who were bonded like Jesus is praying for. You know, chances are good you didn't come to belief all on your own in a, in a room somewhere without ever having anything to do with any of these Christian people. Uh, chances are pretty good somehow some Christian person was tied to it and you saw a little bit, just a taste even, of how they were connected with the wider body. I know for me, a long time ago, uh, I got to know a family that was pretty much all believers together as a family. And being exposed to that at a personal level, you know, spending time at their house, doing things, you know, going out to events and things with them, going to the movies, all kinds of things, actually, actually gave the gospel the credibility to me that it needed in order for me to really take it seriously. Because reading about intense love and reading about the passion Jesus had for people and the, the boldness and the brazenness and the courage to confront people and, and, and tell them what they needed to hear. Like that, that's just words on paper until you're confronted with seeing how it works in actual real life. That's the miracle that I needed. I needed to see how it actually played out in a family in order to believe that it really was the real McCoy. I'd read about it. I'd seen maybe glimpses of good things in different church bodies and groups and whatnot, but I'd never seen it at a close personal level like I saw when I got to know that family really well. And I was just, I was in awe. I was amazed. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't imagine that it could be as tight as that family seemed to be. And, and even beyond into their extended family and, and their friends and, and people that they, they got to know well through their, their church, I was just amazed at how close these people had gotten and how faithful they were to love each other throughout their weaknesses and throughout their arguments and their disagreements. They sure had them. They definitely had them, but, but I was just amazed. You know, and, and who else out there is waiting to see the real thing. That, that's what I think about for you guys out there watching this morning. Who else out there is waiting to see a glimpse of the real thing? And, and how much 
more persuasive would we be if we were closer and we had a commitment to really, really, really dig in, get in the trenches with each other and not give up when somebody confronts us or not, not you know, just lose it when somebody says something that they shouldn't say or, or you know, in the heat of the moment, you know, uh, if, if people really looked out for the needs of others and just looked for ways to go beyond what would be expected and, and really do for them what they most need. I mean, that, that's the kind of stuff that really has persuasive power. That's the kind of stuff that convinces people that, that maybe the Father really does love them and maybe this Jesus who brought this thing into action really was sent from God. Maybe that's really true. That's the thing. And if I could just back up for a moment to our personal, our personal purpose. You know, so many of us want to make a powerful, powerful impact in the world. And, and we're just kind of hoping that maybe we can make that powerful impact independently. Well, you could make some impact independently. But if you look back at Paul's letter to the Corinthians and think about the hand that, that separates itself from the body and is, is down on the ground and look at the body, you know, number one, the body is going to be shorthanded. It's going to have to adapt and it's never going to be quite capable of what it was before with the hand. But that hand, I mean, think about it. If that's you, if that's you, the hand, the member that separated itself from the body, uh, not only is it going to be less effective, but it's not going to last very long. It's not. It's not. And there are so many people out there who have separated themselves from any real closeness in the church. Uh, and, and they're just kind of they're kind of limping around on the sidewalk, you know. And, and it's sort of like, yeah, they're, they're there and they're healthy and they, you know, they're carrying on with life. But spiritually, spiritually, they're, they're draining out. They're, they're, they're weak. And they're actually, they're actually getting closer and closer and closer to what I would think of as spiritual death. Just, just ineffectiveness, lifelessness, um, you know, discouragement and depression and, and just giving in to the dark thoughts and ideas that they've been given in this world and, and not having the strength uh, to, to fight that off on their own and not having the support and the encouragement. And so many believers fall victim to that as they separate themselves from the body. Hard to see, but it's real and it happens. So I'm giving that to you this week to think about as we continue on in this, this fellowship vein because I desperately want to see the real thing happen in the church. I would desperately want to see people become closely bonded, uh, transparent with each other, asking each other for help when they need help, asking each other for prayer when they need prayer, looking out for ways that they can bless each other by being generous, by being compassionate, by being merciful, by being uh, sensitive, people learning to listen to each other and actually hear what the issues are. Uh, I desperately want to see that in the church, not just selfishly because I want to be part of it and experience it and have a, have a better time in my life, but because I want to see how much impact could be had if people really did that. That would be amazing. That's what I'm leaving you with today. I hope to see you again next week. And uh, until then, Jesus bless you and Jesus inspire you to grab a hold of these words and make them real in your life.